What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron, and today we're going to talk through eight players you must start for week 13. These are my best plays of the week, my my guys, if you will. Every single week, I put together my weekly rankings, I compare them with the expert consensus rankings on Fantasy Pros, and then I hand deliver you guys the players that I like more than Analyst X over on Fantasy Pros. So let's not waste any time. We have eight players to get into. If you enjoy at any point, make sure you go down below, subscribe, leave a like. Let's go. Now, of course, as always, the entire week 13 rankings along with Dynasty rankings that I'm actually going to have out tomorrow, Saturday. Fresh set of dynasty rankings for December, rest of season rankings, uh, premium Discord stuff, my prospect model stuff, all that good stuff is over on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. You can find that in the link down below in the description or the top of the comments. As always, if you're not interested, that's all good, man. Let's talk through these players now. We're going to talk through Kenneth Walker up top, and I want to make it clear, people love to get upset. It's actually hilarious. People love to get upset because I make this my eight must start players video. And that is just for SEO purposes of getting you guys to click on this video. These are my best plays my my guys that I think aren't really getting the shine that they deserve in weekly rankings out there. It might be left on your bench when they probably shouldn't be left on your bench. Here's the thing. If I get too fringy and I go into like RB 40 plus territory, they're like, Ron, how the hell is that a must start? RB40 plus, no one's playing them in their lineup. And then if I talk about somebody that's ranked as like the RB8, or I think I ranked uh, Jonathan Taylor as like a top 12 running back the first, the week before he was at the RB1 overall, or the week that he was the RB1 overall, he was at the RB22 in rankings. They're like, Jonathan Taylor, of course you can be in our lineup. He's RB12. It's like, I can't win. You want me to just, eight players have to fall between like RB15 and like RB30? Because then we're not really dealing with a big sample size. But that's enough of me rambling and complaining Again, these are essentially just my favorite plays of the week. Take these as you will, okay? Now, first up, we have Kenneth Walker. He's going to be playing in LA against the Rams. He is my RB6 this week. He's RB10 on the week by consensus, so I'm four spots higher than consensus. And again, Walker is a luxury guy because he's likely in your lineup, but I want to give you that extra nudge, okay? Because people are a little bit down on Kenneth Walker right now. For the first time in his career, it feels like people are souring ever so slightly. Last week, 12 carries, 24 yards. And we did have the touchdowns to sort of make up for it, but he has had 24 carries in his last two games for 43 yards, which is under two yards per carry. That is not good for someone who is praised coming into the league as this pure running back who's very good between the tackles and the receiving game is the part that's questionable. But I think that he has some Saquon to his game where he has very good long speed. He's always trying to, you know, make somebody miss, make a big play. You also have to take into account that bad yards per carry. Again, yards per carry is a bad stat anyways, but he had this one carry that was going to be like a loss for three, and he like tried to turn it back and like make something out of nothing, and it ended up being like a minus 13-yard play. So you take that into account. He is like that, though, where he's trying to, you know, take it to the house, which is really good for fantasy. But sometimes it can backfire, and you have those Saquon-esque 18 carries for 35 yard games. It's just how it is. But I think he's in a great bounce back spot here. He's running cold. I think this is where he runs hot. He's going to be playing against the Rams. And on the, you know, on the outside, it's like, oh, the Rams are a good defense. They have Aaron Donald. Nope. Aaron Donald is out. Ashawn Robinson, another starting interior defensive lineman for them, out. This team is going to have a field day, the Seahawks, against this Rams team with no Aaron Donald, with no Ashawn Robinson. You have no Cooper Cup on offense, no Stafford on offense. They're eight-point favorites in L.A., the Seahawks team, and Kenneth Walker is running up against a non-Aaron Donald front four, front five, whatever you want to call this like sort of patched-together unit that they're going to roll out there. He's going to have a field day on them. Again, they're eight-point favorites, so they're going to be sitting on a lead. Uh, this game could get out of hand pretty easily. Again, it's going to be like Bryce Perkins at quarterback, no Aaron Donald on defense. It's going to get ugly. This could be a game where they have a lot of rush attempts for Kenneth Walker at the end of the game. If he hits 20-plus rushes, I think that that is well within the range of outcomes. To me, because of the environment, because of this banged-up Rams team, I would have him as a top-six option this week. Now, not going away from this game, I also want to talk through DK Metcalf. And I know DK Metcalf finds himself on these lists for me a lot, but I think that he is 
one of the more slept on fantasy wide receivers in the space right now. And I have him as my wide receiver 12 this week, again, in Los Angeles. Consensus has him as wide receiver 15. So I'm three spots higher than consensus. And I think that he is going to get some of his shine, some big plays before the game is no longer competitive, like we were saying with Kenneth Walker salting the game away in the fourth quarter. And DK Metcalf has been somebody that has been on the wrong side of variance this week. If we look at expected points per game, which is just simply based on your targets, your A dot, your red zone targets, your volume across the board, how many fantasy points should you be scoring on a weekly basis? He is, over the last five weeks, the wide receiver three in expected points per game at 18.1 points per game behind just Devontae Adams and Justin Jefferson. And instead of being a top five wide receiver in the mix with them, he is the wide, rec wide receiver 16 in points per game. So the wide receiver three in expected points per game, the wide receiver 16 in points per game, that's a huge disparity. The weird part is too, it's not like he has bad quarterback play. Geno Smith has been playing great. So it's not like, oh, uh, I guess you could kind of say Deontay Johnson situation where like Deontay Johnson is commanding targets, but nothing's really coming of it because it's with Pickett. Same with like a DJ Moore. Metcalf has Geno Smith who's been balling out this year. I don't have an explanation for why the points haven't been there, but... We have to think that positive regression is coming here. We've seen it with Mixon. We see it time and time again. Players are underperforming their, what they're expected, and then they just go off out of nowhere. And this is going to be a, a soft secondary here against the Rams, where I know they have Jalen Ramsey, and they're always like talked up as a good secondary. This team is falling apart. Again, we're talking about Aaron Donald. Geno Smith is going to have all day to throw, and this is a guy where, I, again, we're talking about Geno Smith, but if you look at the tape or you look at any of the stats, this guy is sitting in the pocket and just – dotting people straight up dotting people bombing it on defenses like some of the throws that he had in that saints game a while back was insane he was making plays against the bucks in berlin if you give him all day to throw in this pocket with no aaron donald i think that it's going to get really ugly for this team now if you look at just like fantasy points allowed the rams have been actually pretty good but if you look at just the last five weeks they have been the worst or the fourth worst pass epa per play defense which is just a really strong defensive efficiency metric that I've gravitated towards recently. If we look at the uh, definition for expected points added, EPA or expected points added is a measure of how well a team performs relative to expectation. For example, if a team starts a drive on the 50-yard line, the expected points to start the drive would be about 2.5. The team ends the drive in a field goal, thus scoring three points. Its EPA for the drive would be found by taking their points that they added, or the points that they scored, three, minus 2.5, which is what they were expected, 0.5, EPA on that drive. And then you can just shrink that down into per play, all of that good stuff. So on a per play basis on pass plays, they are giving up the fourth most expected points added on a per play basis. So you are getting big plays on these guys. They're surrendering first downs. They're surrendering touchdowns in the passing game. When teams pass the ball, they are going above and beyond what they're expected versus this Rams secondary in the last five weeks. Now, moving on from that, we have... Another another frequenter on this list that has been on this list in the past, Debo Smith. Or, <laughs> I don't know why I I don't know why I charged that up and then just said the name wrong. But Debo Samuel here, consensus has him wide receiver twenty four. He is my wide receiver seventeen again. I don't know what that. I don't know who the hell D Debo Smith is or what I was thinking of. Maybe Devonta Smith. I don't know. But this is another. And I know I'm going to sound like a, uh, a broken record here. Another positive regression candidate. I will go back to the well. I know we went, went back to the well with Metcalf. We're going to go back to the well with Debo Samuel here. And I know he's been frustrating recently. They bring in CMC. And this offense has really been spreading the wealth where Debo isn't getting peppered with targets. CMC is taking away from him. But the volume, when you look at it, hasn't been that bad because... You have to remember, he's not a 30% target share guy, but, you know, he's probably flirting with like 20 to 25% target share. He's getting like three, four carries a game, two, three, four carries a game. And you get in a spot here where you combine the expected points from rushing and receiving, you put them together, and it's not terrible. This is him over the last five weeks. I've just been using that as kind of a, a good barometer of sort of like, you know, the most current state of the NFL. And over the last five weeks, we look at expected points per game. He is the wide receiver 12. He is in the mix with guys like... Cooper Cup before he got hurt, Tyree Kill, Hopkins in terms of a from a, a volume perspective. But when you look at FPOE, right? So you have EP, which is expected points. FPOE is fantasy points over expected. Everybody on this list outside of one player, outside of DK Metcalf, who's also on this list, the two biggest regression candidates in my eyes, 
minus 1.7. Debo's at minus two and a half. And the crazy part is Debo is not only underperforming his expected points by the most on this list, but he's somebody that has always been very efficient. He's at minus 2.2 on the entire year in terms of FPOE. He was at plus 6.1 FPOE last year. So that's like an 8 FPOE swing from last year to this year. He has never been lower than 0.4 FPOE on an entire year. Again, this year he's at minus 2.2. I have to believe that this corrects even a little bit at this point. Again, the issues with Debo has been volume-based, right? McCaffrey's taking a lot of his volume. I think the efficiency there is a lot of luck-based stuff. I, I mean, maybe he he was dealing with an injury a few weeks ago, but I mean, he dealt with an injury last year, came back and was, you know, balling out. I want to say with no Elijah Mitchell, that they're going to get Debo more involved in the run game. McCaffrey's also a little bit banged up with his knee. Maybe he gets a little bit more involved in the, uh, you know, pass game, screen game, all of that. I just have to believe that Debo is as talented as we saw last year, or even a fraction as talented for me to want to put him at, you know, I don't even think it's that egregious. Like wide receiver 17. You guys want to, the, the, the consensus wants to have him, have him in the wide receiver 24 area. And I know that he hasn't been scoring a ton recently, but again, I think that that pendulum is going to swing back and he has a spot here that isn't a great matchup. He's playing, I believe at home against the Dolphins. He's playing at home against the Dolphins and the Dolphins have actually been great against the pass, but Debo plays in both the rushing and the receiving game. He wins on efficiency. He wins on touchdowns. This game has a 46 and a half over under between the, uh, between the Dolphins and the 49ers, which is the fifth highest of the slate. There will be points here. There will be big plays. There will be touchdowns. I like Debo in the mix here in a spot, you know, wide receiver 24 area of consensus rankings where if you're talking between like a couple fringe wide receiver twos, why not dial up Debo just because I think that he, he has like slate breaking upside. He could drop a 30 bomb lead the league or you know lead the nfl for the week in fantasy points and win you your week i'm not sure you can find that upside in that range now after that we have another uh wide receiver two that i like this week juju smith schuster and this is another one i wanted to bring up because i think people feel burned by him right last week i had him in a ton of leagues we fired him up as a wide receiver two and he plays on just 40 percent of the routes his lowest total of the entire year now Consensus has him as wide receiver 25. He's my wide receiver 20. And I think when it comes to the concussion stuff, that's why he missed that one week. He missed the week before with a concussion. I think that we should probably start getting used to players coming back from a concussion and being used sparingly. I think he just had the uh, the Debo, or not Debo, the Tua thing early on in the season. And it just becomes such a point of emphasis to protect players and concussions and all that. And that's probably better for the sport. But I think the days of concussion protocol coming out of concussion protocol and then playing that week in a full capacity are probably no longer here. I want to say that he cleared it like on Saturday too. Something that I wish that I was more keyed in on. I think all of us fantasy guys got duped by that. If a guy is just getting off a concussion protocol this year on like Saturday or Friday, you should probably be giving them a really good ding here. Now, I think that he's going to play in full this week, right? Now we're a full week removed from the concussion, from the protocol, from the 40% of the routes. And this game is going to be fireworks. He's going to be in Cincinnati, Chiefs versus the Bengals, 52 and a half over under, highest of the week. Both teams are top two in neutral pass rate. Literally, you are top two in neutral pass rate the last, like, I think four weeks. So you have two teams that are going to pass the ball a ton, score the ball a ton. There's going to be fireworks here. And the Bengals are also, even though that they've had a strong pass defense this year, they're going to be out without their number one graded coverage corner in Chidobi Awuzie. I love Juju this week as an upside wide receiver too as well. Now, shifting over to running backs here, we have Gus Edwards, Gus Bus. Somebody I'm higher uh, or much higher on than consensus where I have him as RB23. Consensus has him uh, RB33, so that's plus 10 for me. He's going to be at home versus Denver. And let's talk through kind of his usage last week. He had a couple weeks off with an injury. He comes back in and literally immediately – Harbaugh gives him the keys to the castle. Immediately, he gets 14 points per game, expected points per game. This is from uh, PFS expected points per game. And I shrinked it down to the last three weeks, just so you could sort of see what does 14 points per game on an expected basis look like. And that's about RB2 usage, right? He's right in the mix here with guys like Singletary, Montgomery, Jamal Williams, Nick Chubb, in terms of just the volume that he was given. So he's going to get those between the tackles, Grinder carries 14 expected points per game is going to be enough for him to be in like my top 24 running back area. 
and he's playing the Broncos this week. And the Broncos, as good of the as good of a defense as they've been, their defense is elite. Pat Sertain is a monster, but their rush defense isn't that great. If you look at the last five weeks, they're 15 in rush EPA per play allowed. So they're about league average against the run. We know the Ravens are going to run the ball a ton, especially with no Rashad Bateman out there, and it's just Mark Andrews. Demarcus Robinson, Deshaun Jackson, like the funky bunch has been super, super ugly to watch the last few weeks. They're going to get the run game going. You have Lamar Jackson giving that efficiency to Gus Edwards. And when we're talking about 14 expected points per game, something in that vicinity, he's going to be in the mix for like 15 to 18 touchdowns and or 15 to 18 touches and a touchdown. Something you can't say about a lot of running backs in this like RB25 area this week. After that, we're going to talk about two onesies here. Two onesies. We got a tight end and a quarterback. We're going to talk through Cole Komet real quick. And this is assuming that we see Justin Fields. Uh, he practiced in full, I want to say on Thursday. Seems like he's going to play. If he plays, I think he's going to be less likely to scramble with the shoulder issue. I think he's going to sit in the pocket, throw the ball a little bit more. So I have Cole Komet at home versus the Packers as my tight end nine. Consensus has him as tight end 12. So like three spots higher, nothing crazy. But I like Komet this week as a strong streaming option. There's no Darnell Mooney. You have Chase Claypool in there who's yet to pass eight PPR points in Chicago. Cole Komet's going to be Justin Fields' first option here. I like him as a good bet to score a touchdown. And I let, uh, maybe this is a little bit narrative-y for what I like to talk about here. But but p- place your tinfoil hats on real quick. Cole Komet has had those two monster 20-plus point games this week, right? Or, or this year. And maybe it's just a coincidence, but those two came at home. He had two back-to-back home games. Boom, two 20-point games at home. Since then, he has not played another game in Chicago. This week against the Packers, he returns back home with Justin Fields. I think there is something to those, you know, sort of home away splits, especially with like tight ends and, uh, you know, scoring touchdowns and stuff. So I kind of like it. I, I wouldn't be shocked if we see a little explosion here. Again, if we see a healthy Fields, if we see a healthy Aaron Rodgers, there could be fireworks, right? You could see something like maybe not fireworks, maybe like, you know, like a, a 30 to 24 point game, something like that. But yeah, I think Komet's a great option. And Joku's like banged up. I wouldn't really want to start him this week. You have a lot of options that aren't that great. Greg Dolchitz has lost steam recently. Uh, Tough to trust Everett. He's working back from an injury, I believe. And you have Keenan Allen out there. And you have Josh Palmer, who's been balling lately. Plus Eckler taking a lot away. So I don't mind Komet. I think he's a good bet to like lead his team in targets. Maybe score a touchdown in this game. Uh, After that, we have another guy who we can talk about some, some home away splits with. But I have Jared Goff here. He's going to be at home against Jacksonville. He's my QB 13. He's consensus QB 16, so I'm three spots higher. And this is a layup matchup here for Jared Goff. And his home away splits, guys, are crazy. He is a 20-plus point per game quarterback at home. He has in a six-game sample size. Also, I I don't know why I put, uh, like, receptions, touchdowns. I probably should have uh, taken all of that out of this graphic, but... The points per game is really all that matters. Pretty much 23 points per game at home. He's essentially like Jared Goff is just Joe Burrow at home and he's Zach Wilson on the road. It's insane. But you also get the Jaguars here. The Jaguars are coming into Detroit, allowing the eighth most adjusted fantasy points to quarterbacks. And the Jaguars are funny because they're finally figuring out on offense with Trevor Lawrence and Christian Kirk and Uh, I mean, you can't say the same for ETM, but like Zay Jones, right? Winning that fourth quarter or that game against the Ravens in the fourth quarter on those like two huge drives. The offense is clicking. The offense looks dangerous. And the defense that was elite early on in the year. Uh, Trayvon Walker was balling out. I want to say, I honestly can't even name. I I think Louis Cine is a guy for them. That's like kind of good, but they were a strong defense. They were like top 10 in EPA per play, top 10 in football outsiders, uh, the defensive efficiency. They've really slid back since then. Again, allowing the eighth most adjusted fantasy points to quarterbacks. And Vegas thinks that there's going to be a lot of points scored in this game. They're giving in an over-under 51, which is the second highest of the slate behind just the Chiefs-Bengals game, with the Lions projected for 26.25 points. That's their team total, which is behind just Cleveland, Dallas, and the Chiefs. So they are projected to have the fourth most points scored this week. It's supposed to be a high-scoring game. There's been a lot of points available here in this Detroit stadium. There's going to be a lot of points, a lot of yards. You have a light matchup and a great environment against the Jaguars. If you're out there and you need a quarterback start, I think Jared Goff is a great, great option this week. Now, to bring her home, we have one last player, somebody that's probably on your bench. You're thinking maybe I should flex him. 
Now, again, you know, if you have, if Juju is your last flex guy and you have like wide, top 24 wide receivers through the flex, then you watch my videos in the offseason and you've done a great job. But if you're struggling a little bit, I know some of us are struggling out here. Michael Gallup isn't too, too bad this week. I know that he hasn't really popped or anything. He hasn't really given you a usable week yet. But man, he just missed. He just missed on having a monstrous game last week. He had 92% of the routes, 92% route participation. Now, this is a screenshot. I'm going to explain the screenshot a little bit. I can't just flash this and not give any sort of context. But you have uh, receivers and tight ends. This is from the utilization report from Dwayne McFarlane. He does amazing work. I don't know how he charts all of this every single week. But we're looking down here at like week 12. So that was Thanksgiving, right? 92% of the routes is what he ran. That's his highest route participation of the season. He had 29% of the targets. Highest of the season. 39% air yard share. Highest of the season. He's finally rounding back into form here. It feels like that was the okay. I'm officially back game for Michael Gallup, even though he didn't produce, but just commanding volume in that capacity and participating on that percentage of the routes tells me that, I mean, obviously he's getting healthier every single week from that ACL injury, but it feels like it feels like he's about to be back here soon. He probably should have scored much more than 11 points last week. And he gets an Indiana pass defense. That is tough. They're allowing the least amount of adjusted fantasy points to opposing wide receivers. But the Cowboys should score a ton at home here. They're going to be playing the Colts at home. They have a Vegas implied team total of 27.25, which is second highest behind just the Chiefs this week. There's going to be a lot of points on the table. I like Gallup to beat somebody deep. I like him to have, you know, five for 70, maybe a touchdown. I think that you could do a lot worse then Michael Gallup again, wide receiver 37, so high end wide receiver four, low end wide receiver three type flex play for me. But consensus has him as like wide receiver 43, so I'm six spots higher than those boys. Now, that is going to do it for us today. Again, as always, if you want to see the entire rankings on my top 50 running backs, wide receivers, my top 25 quarterbacks, tight ends, that'll all be on patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. That'll be down below in the comments, down below in the description as well. But if you can't, contribute there i appreciate all likes subscribes comments and i promise guys i've been bad about re responding to comments but I, I i swear i read all of them i swear i read all of them it's just dude we got we're, we're so deep into the season i don't know it's just overwhelming um but yeah I, I i do sort of you know i'll reply i'll reply here and there but i sort of i sort of interact with you guys um or i save interacting with you guys a ton for streams you know that's when you guys can kind of like personally actually understand instead of me just like replying uh like thanks um but yeah that's gonna do it if you enjoyed subscribe leave a like and i will see you guys in the next one i got the juice i got the juice Channel, chat on foolies glad i'm on even my haters kind of glad i'm on rest in peace to my bag up on rapper song singer suspended subpoena from mr meaner